I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And today we're going to be tackling that question that everybody who's coming to Nicaragua gets asked. Aren't you terrified that the government's going to take away your land, your house, your stuff? When you live in Nicaragua, everything gets taken from you all the time. You must be terrified. Seriously? Okay, we gotta talk about this because everybody who comes here gets asked the same thing. It comes in emails, it gets posted on forums, your friends say it to you. Where does this come from? Why are people saying it? And is it a concern? Okay, so let's talk about land seizures in Nicaragua and other places. Let's start with a little history because this is important for building our context. Nicaragua, like the United States, Canada, Mexico, and other places lies in the Americas. These are places known for having been colonized. So the history is that there were a group of people who lived here previously, we'll call them Americans, and there were a group of people who came to visit them, we'll call them Europeans, and by and large, they took their land. And today, much of the land that people live on here uh, depends on where you are in the Americas today, the Americas, the continents. Uh, some of them are relatively still with land being held by the original inhabitants or more appropriately their, their offspring. Uh, or some areas have essentially all of the land has been taken by the European colonizers and does not exist for the people who actually have the original claim to the land. Now you can say, well, in war or whatever, land can be seized and, it, and all concepts of ownership go out the window. Generally, that is not the case, though. We generally accept that during war that private ownership of land does get retained, just the governments change hands. That is not always the case. So in all is fair in love and war, they say, you can argue whether you not you believe that to be true. But in this area, it's important to have this context that uh, much of Latin America, the land is currently held in relatively large percentage by descendants of the original inhabitants. Not entirely, by any stretch, but to some degree. And in the United States, essentially none is held by the original inhabitants. What is held by the original inhabitants is almost always relegated to low value property far away from prime real estate zones. For example, large portions of Oklahoma, some of the poorest and least valuable land in the United States is used primarily for reservation land. That's a very important context and background to where we're gonna start. Right, so we're starting from a world where the governments that exist today primarily exist in forcing the seizure of land historically. So everybody, if you have a historical context, is looking at at least large scale land seizure, if not essentially total land seizure of all places. I believe it is the United States who has the largest amount of land seizure and the weakest concept of property ownership specifically at the time that the United States was founded, both it was founded under British common law, which does not see large scale private ownership of property. Uh, and especially at the time, they were very dedicated and remain very dedicated to a nobility system where inheritance by the government, because all nobles are government by default, uh, all that inheritance of government is that by your government association and your, your status in life grants you large-scale land ownership that is weakening it is starting to go away but certainly king charles just took the throne again and it continues this is not a system that is being abated at this time so england especially back then had a very strong concept of weak ownership for the populace the united states carried on with that tradition and when it came time to write the US Constitution, Monroe, taking a hint from Adams in Scotland, said, oh, there are these things that are very, very important, life, liberty, and oh, we're not really into the property thing like was written originally. We're going to modify the word property to say pursuit of happiness. The government can take your stuff, right? And to some degree, this was because property was not considered the important thing in British and British colonial worlds the way that it was in Scottish, right? The Scottish people were like, property is really important and the British would come and take it from us. So we really enshrine in law and in our writings that property is so key. 
but the United States was not from that system. They came from the country, they were a colony of a country that had been taking land, not having it taken from them. And the colonists were taking the land from, from the original inhabitants, not having it taken from them. And then there was this thing where they had property of people and they didn't want to exactly enshrine that in law, so they left it out. So there's lots of reasons for it, and I'm not saying it was a bad thing that they left it out. But the United States was founded with the concept that property ownership was fungible. The government, the king, the, the people who are better than you, your betters, as they would say, the peerage, had more value than the common person, and land ownership was questionable. And they had to do this because the country was founded on the concept of stealing land. And so they couldn't do anything else. And, and given the time frame and, and that they were still in the process of taking land, had they enshrined that in law, the Indians would have been like, oh, we're just going to join the United States. Boom, we own everything. Ha 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 ha. Fight that, right? So that's why they left property out for lots of reasons. So when we're looking at the Latin American states. Often these states are much younger and they don't have a very clear cut colonials coming in, taking all the land uh, and, and um, then having their descendants own everything, and the original inhabitants being with nothing. Not that the original inhabitants didn't get treated terribly, they did, of course. But the, uh, the general commonality throughout almost all of Latin America is that there is a very, very heavy indigenous population remaining in the visible population. And so you have indigenous zones, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the non-indigenous zones. The general population, remains heavily descended from the original inhabitants, often with large amounts of colonial DNA mixed in as well. And there are cases where it is purely colonial DNA, but those are the exception, not the norm. In the United States, it is to have any traceable amount of Native American uh, DNA is the exception, not the norm. So very, very different scenarios as to property concepts over time. So that sets the stage for the modern world. Now in the modern world, we know, because every single thing we look at, every time the United States has news about places like Nicaragua, it is taking what is going on in the United States, the things that Americans are already worried about, things that are problems in the United States, things that are, you know, in the current consciousness, and then claiming them to be happening elsewhere so that Americans go, well, that's credible, it's happening here, and we're constantly being told that we're good and everyone else is bad. So if we're having a problem like this, they, oh, it's totally reasonable that this other place I know nothing about will have the same problem, but worse, because they're not America. And so this is a standard, standard trope that the United States uses in its propaganda and its, its quasi-news situations about other places, right? So we see this constantly. So this is a very important underpinning. We expect that the United States to follow the pattern it keeps following and to generate fear and uncertainty and doubt about other countries based on current events in the United States or semi-current events in the United States. Right, so that's, that's the expectation. That is, that is just how the US functions and it makes sense. It's completely logical, it's not a conspiracy. This is if people just doing their jobs did what came naturally, these are, this is the easy path. The path of least resistance to convincing America is this, the Americans that something is happening somewhere else is to base it on things that are happening in America because people are really up in arms about whatever's happening in America, but are, have been drilled for so long that the US does all these things better. So you often hear the accusations of bad healthcare. Oh, well, the healthcare there, right? Are you serious? Of all things. Clearly, this only works on people who've never set foot outside the United States. And, and they're dedicated to, but even Canada and the UK aren't very good. Yes, yes, the three of them together are the world examples of failed healthcare. Everyone in the world uses those three as the example that's, and that the US has to rely on. The global example of failed healthcare to say, look, we're not the only ones who failed, proves the point beyond anything anyone could ever say. Right? Every person who says, but Canada, but the UK, everyone in the world hears, I know, oh my gosh, I know how bad it is, and I don't want to say it, but I know, and I'm admitting it. Right? So that's, that's what, if you say that, that's what we're hearing. Right? No one thinks you think Canada and the UK are the examples of good healthcare. No one thinks that you think, honestly, that, you know, universal healthcare instantly is the only factor that matters. You don't even need doctors. Well, they tried universal healthcare. It's not great there. Yes. Even good ideas can be implemented badly. 
even you know good roads implemented by a corrupt government where they don't actually build the roads still bad right like so we constantly when you live in nicaragua you're talking about coming to nicaragua everybody is going to bombard you with the same statement the same leading thing oh land is constantly being stolen there being seized there aren't you afraid it'll happen to you right so again there's a pattern lead with a statement as if it's true and then question your sanity based on the danger of the statement that we're acting like isn't the thing in question. But the thing in question isn't your sanity. The thing that's in question is, is land seizure a risk? So we don't know. So let's dig into it because this gets really interesting. So first of all, the United States is famous for having eminent domain and it's famous for using it. Americans live in a world where we're constantly worried about eminent domain. What if they find oil under my land? What if they find uh, diamonds under my land? What if a highway would be handy where my house is? There's thing after thing after thing that could result in someone coming by and taking your land. Now, you'll probably get paid for it. It's not absolutely the worst thing in the world normally, but maybe, maybe not. And almost all Americans know someone that this has directly happened to. And I can tell you it happened to me as a child. We had a private company with no interest in the public space, came through and bought the right to take over our land. And you can say, well, they had the, the mineral rights. They were allowed to do things under the land. Yes, but they also took above ground as well. And they now eventually we got it back, but they took and did years of damage and changed uh, our land usage, all kinds of things we couldn't do. We, you know, we lost rights to do things on the land. And this was a private company. It was not the government. This was not for the good of the people. It did not provide services to the people through whose area it came. This was not like... Oh, we need a water source, and, and this is where it has to be, so we're going to put it in, but you get access to the water. This was a pipeline for gas that was not made available to the local community. So the local community was impacted. We were just one of countless places that eminent domain took our property, and then they also used that eminent domain to keep that source of fuel from us and provide it to other people elsewhere in the country. So it was a way to take from one group and give to another, right? So it was, it was not an equitable thing, and it was not done by the government, so there's no oversight. The government simply gave permission to a private company who simply wanted the land. And yes, it was a practical usage for it. And yes, the private company didn't see a value in providing a common good because that's not, they're a private company. And so, like many things, this allows for privatization and seizure of land under the, the guise of eminent domain by private companies, right? So, or by the government. Basically, anyone can seize land if they pay the right people enough in the United States. We're all used to this, and we're all fearful of this. It's not that, it's not super common, right? But it happens enough that we know it's an established thing and everyone's aware of it. And because everyone's aware of it, we start to think that other places must have this problem too, and certainly some do, many do. And some places have just outright land seizures. So it plants the seed of fear because Americans are already fearful of this problem in America. So then when you come, and this is a great story, right? We came here, we want to build a house. We talked to our architect, we talked to our lawyers. Okay, so when we know a new road is going to be built in front of our house, no problem, right? How far back do we have to set our wall so they can't take, so they're not going to take our wall, they're only going to take our land. And they said, I don't understand. What do you, what do you mean? Well, like, you know, when the road comes through, when they put in a bigger road, how much of our land will they take? How far back do we have to go to be safely away from what they'll seize from us? Because that's what happens. The government owns the land in front of your house. And if you live in America, you know this is true everywhere. Wherever the road is, a certain amount of space from the road is the government's. Just like any international border, the law does not apply co completely, right? So all these things, your land isn't yours when it's close to a road. And so really small houses sometimes really don't have any land of their own and they're kind of in a gray area. So it's really, really normal. We're just used to this whole concept of, okay, we have to, the government actually owns this much of what I just had to buy. I only own from here back. And they're like, what? That, they couldn't believe it. Like we had to explain this over and over again. And they're just like, that's, is that real? You can't be serious. The government just 
takes your land. So this is the response of actual Nicaraguans who work in Nicaragua, who work in the area of land management, right, where they're lawyers and they're dealing with this stuff. This is such a foreign concept that it shocked them that some place like the United States could do this, right? But Americans would be like, but of course you can do that. That's just how everything works. In the United States, the idea that the government is going to take what is yours is so normal that we no longer think of it as a weird thing. And we stop thinking about it as land seizure. And we start just treating it as that's how things work. When it gets to that scale, that's corruption or bad doings on a scale that like the brain doesn't function with anymore. So here in Nicaragua, it remains that the idea of seizure is so foreign that it is truly foreign. And it's not something that they plan around and it's not something they worry about. Actual Nicaraguans, not Americans posing as Nicaraguans who post on the channel, but people here in Nicaragua who live here and own houses and such do not live in fear of having their houses taken by the government. I've never once met a Nicaraguan who expressed that that was something they had thought of. It just isn't something in the consciousness here. So that tells us a lot about it. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. We're going to get to that. But it does suggest that it doesn't happen enough for people to be worried about it. And it is only in America that it happens enough that it seems like a credible threat even somewhere else. So let's talk about the claims that are made today. Now we're going to get to the claims that are made in the past. Today I hear a lot, and remember, I think we've had some episodes about the immense amount of gossip that happens in Nicaragua because it's truly epic. The, the word of mouth news, and I talked about it a little bit on the news article from, from a few days ago, but when you have a tremendous amount of word of mouth news everywhere, what you get is this gossip thing and you hear so-and-so had this happen and oh, they're gonna take their house. So we hear these stories. And you hear a lot of things. You hear a lot of crazy things. And generally you learn to take them with a grain of salt. But when you're being reinforced that people from the United States are saying it's a real fear they're gonna take, uh, take your land, take your house or whatever. And then you have people on the ground saying, ooh, they're gonna take your house, take your land, whatever. That's easy to put together and say, well, th that seems reasonable. You know, it doesn't mean it's true, but it makes it reasonable. And it makes you think, wow, that's something I have to be worried about, right? And this is a reinforcing snowball of all these things make you worry about it. But I live in a place where I have an opportunity to follow up on many of these claims, and I have done so. And here's what I have found, is that in every case that I'm able to track down, which is a very small number, so let's all be fair, this is an absolutely tiny anecdotal amount of information. But we'll get to why that's important in a minute. In every case that I've bothered to track down of recent events, the same thing has happened. Either a person, something supposedly has happened to them and their land has been seized, or their land is about to be seized because they've done something. And in every case, when following up, it turns out that that person may still be there, may have gone somewhere, maybe have, has problems with the law, maybe does not. That part's very much all over the place. But the one thing that has been universally true is that they are still the owners of whatever land we're talking about. The land, the building, the business, in all of those cases, they still have that thing. Now, one thing that has happened, there's certainly been people who have fallen on the wrong side of the law or whatever, and have failed to keep their businesses open, whether that is simply a revocation of their business license or something more dramatic, I don't know. And I don't know how much it matters. And I don't. this happens in the United States and in every country every day. If people break the law via a business, that business gets shut down. That is a normal thing that we expect. So that is not a surprising thing. It may happen more often here. It may be easier to ha have happen whatever. Sure, that's a reasonable assumption. I don't know that it's true, but it's reasonable. But that their property is seized has never once come up in a situation, but I've had it claimed many times, and in every single time that I have checked, it has not been seized. One thing that I can point to is there is a very old building that I am aware of that is no longer standing. The building is completely in rubble. That building does appear to have been seized by the government, but 
It is not owned by the central government. It is owned by the tax office. And it has spray painted on the side of it, property of the income tax office, which suggests that the business that had been there was not paying its employees properly and skipped out of the country to avoid going to jail or something similar for stealing from the employees. That kind of thing I would expect to have your land seized. If you did that as a business in the United States, you would expect to have your business seized and its assets because your employees payment comes first just as there is serious talk right now of the seizure of Trump properties because of a potential for non-payment. We don't know that he's not going to pay. I'm just saying that the discussion of seizing his businesses and properties and real estate is currently underway as an option should payment fail to be made on debts. And that is an absolutely standard thing. It is part of doing business you expect when you can't pay your debts uh, or you steal from someone in the case of not paying your, your employees their, their salary. You expect to have whatever properties you have seized if you don't come up with the cash to pay that. That is part of the agreement of being a business. So that does not suggest a problem of having your houses or properties seized. And what we see constantly throughout the country is places where we wished that land was being seized Currently, we see a lot of this in San Wendell Sur, where I talk about this a lot. There's a lot of land that was uh, purchased and has been let to go uh, abandoned, and there's no plan of anyone to come back. It has been left for a really long time. It would be wonderful if the government stepped in and said, look, it would be great if they contacted the people, said, look, we're going to take your land if you don't do something with it. You got to do something. You can't just, you're screwing everyone over. The whole community is losing from this. You got to do something. And if they come down and they build a house or they sell it, whatever, great, great, no problem. But if they say, no, I'm not going to do it, it's going to stay empty and you're going to like it, then the government should go, no, and take it and let and, and sell it at auction or something, right? Do something to give it back to the community so that people can invest in it and, and hopefully build something or whatever they're going to do, right? Something to improve the community instead of hold, using foreign resources to keep communities from being able to develop. Right. That's, that's a big problem, and it's a, it's a threat to the national economy. And so there would be nice that there was some more ability for seizure. We're actually constantly, as a country, talking about how much we wish there were ways for there to be land and property seizure because of these problems. And another great example is all up and down the Leon coast, you will find uh, properties that are abandoned, buildings that are falling down, things that have been derelict for decades. And... No one can locate the owners. No, if you can, you can't get the owners to agree to anything, especially not to fixing it. And because of infighting between families, people decide to put the local communities and economy uh, under, the, under the, the wheel. And that's who suffers because of a decision not to invest, not to maintain. And those are things that, again, as a community, it would be wonderful if the government stepped in and said, okay, look, we understand that you guys can't make a deal on this. We're going to force the issue. Either you are going to improve it or we're going to take it and we're going to pay you a reasonable but small amount of money for the property, right? If it's estimated to be worth between four and $10,000, we're only going to pay four. This isn't a way for you to get a good deal, but we are going to take it because there is someone who's going to pay that four and then at least do something with it. Even if just cleaning it up, just putting in a park and maintaining nice trees, great. But having derelict buildings that are that are dangerous and dirty and an eyesore, and it's just, it's very foolish. And it invites crime, right? Broken window problems. So we wish that there was more eminent domain, not as much as the United States, but more than Nicaragua has. And that's a real, so it's a real problem that it doesn't exist more. And so at no point have I found any credible suggestion that currently we are seeing any amount of seizures. We are seeing people who get in trouble and have to flee the country. We are seeing people get arrested. We are seeing businesses fail. But what we're not seeing with any credible reference is seizures. So that's important today. That is the current state of things. We have no reason to believe. And, and this is important. We get nonstop bombarded by news from the United States, news from the North, that says things that we can walk around and visibly see are not true. It is so easily evident because it's such a small country that when they make a claim in the United States, oh, this thing happened, this person did this, this was, we can walk around and see. Is that true? Is that make sense? And we see the counter arguments, right? So for example, you'll hear, oh, this person who's in this position had something happen to them. 
right? And, it, and here it's, this crime was committed. And then you're like, well, yeah, no one's, no one's disputing that the crime was committed. It's just that, you know, they had this job. Well, what does their job have to do with it, right? It's a criminal question. So when things do happen, you're often like, there's something missing from what we're getting from the states, right? Like, like oh, there's land seizure. Was it because no one paid taxes? Was it because it was, like, there's all kinds of things, right? That, that, that Then you'd say, oh, that's not really what we call seizure. It is technically, I guess, but it's not what we think of, right? If the United States, if you don't pay your property taxes for a decade, and then they come in and take land that you're not living on, is it seizure? Yes. Is it what we talk about as land seizures? No, not at all. So that's very important to understand that in the United States, we don't think of the same behavior as being a land seizure, but in Nicaragua, suddenly we do because we're trying to invoke fear and uncertainty and doubt. Okay, so the big thing that a lot of people point to is 40 years ago during the war that there were land seizures then. Now, this one feels much more credible. However, it's important to ask some questions because it would feel credible because we were presented with the there has been land seizures in the news in the north for decades. And here on the ground, much of what people believe has happened in the past comes from news sources that are not coming from inside the country. So they're being bombarded with the same news. And if they hear it enough and people don't travel and ask questions, it's easy to say, well, I saw it in the news. It must be true, right? The United States wouldn't lie to us. That's a really important thing to understand that the news sources that people are getting here is the same as everywhere else. And so they are fighting the same misinformation. So every time that I've followed up on this, because it begs some very important questions. And those questions include, was land seized at all? Because people would say it, and if someone can't produce that land, then it becomes very difficult to know if it actually happened. Well, no, it happened somewhere. Okay, where? Right, now I'm sure that you're going to find specific examples. I do not doubt that, So, but I have not been presented with one. But I am very confident that they do exist that play into this story. But, and I've, and I've talked to people recently, Now I talk to people all the time who claim that this happened, right, constantly. But I recently talked to someone who, who has a, but I have friends that had this happen to them, right? And a lot of people in the United States claim that they had this happen to them. So this is very important. Some of those people absolutely are just lying. There are people who are not Nicaraguan but claim to be, people who have never lived in Nicaragua but claim to be, who have these stories that their land was taken from them. And it's a very easy story to tell because at this point, anyone who fled during the war has been gone for a generation, and there's really no way to tell if someone is or isn't Nicaraguan, if they lived here or didn't. The amount of follow-up that you would have to do is ridiculous. And the amount that people who fled during that time don't really remember the details, so it's easy to give an ambiguous story that's very fuzzy and be like, I know my family lost all their stuff, you know, during, we had to flee during the war. Okay, great. People flee during wars. So bad things happen. That's, that's certainly true. But there's a bunch of questions that come up that no one ever has an answer for. And I'm not saying that no one does, but we have to question very heavily every time someone comes back, do you have answers to all these questions? Is there actual proof of it? Does the place even exist? Is it even a real thing? And did this really happen to you, right? So, and I understand that that's a very tough thing to prove 40 years later or whatever. So I don't want to um, discount the fact that there is potentially credible references to this happening, but there's a number of questions. And every time I've asked these questions, the answers I've got are either, I'm not gonna answer the necessary questions or actually, yes, no, those things happen. So some of the things that have to be asked are, was the land seized before someone left the country or was it seized once it was abandoned? In many cases, I have heard, well, land that we abandoned was taken. Okay, so that is plausible. I don't know that it actually happened, but would we consider that a negative? Today, we would certainly hope that that would happen. Abandoned land is a major problem. So it would be great to have found out that abandoned land was, was dealt with in a more appropriate way in the past, and now they're just more hesitant to do so. Maybe it caused some problems in the past, and maybe, but I don't know that it happened. We're just hypothesizing that this is a reasonable way that it could have happened. And of course, abandoned land often doesn't get its taxes paid. So was it seized because it was abandoned, or was it seized because it was abandoned and the taxes were not paid? Was it, was it seized because a lease expired? Was it abandoned because it, there was another claim on it and the claim, the, the alternative claim was not defended. 
Right? There's a lot of a lot of questions here that often don't get answers. And then the big one, the claims that I have heard from the other side is that, at least in many cases, the land was not seized. The land had been seized. It was stolen land and it was being returned to the people. In some cases, returned to the original owner. In many cases, the original owner no longer exists in which case it is returned to some form of the people, whether going directly to people who need it, going to the government, whatever. I don't know how you handle that. That's a tough one. But the claim was that under a long period of non-Nicaraguan rule of the country, foreign powers seized a lot of property, either directly through uh, military means or indirectly through corruption, and stole from the Nicaraguan people and owned that land. I'm not saying that I know that that's true. I'm not saying that there's a suggestion that that's true. What I'm saying is that this is the counterclaim. This is the impetus of the situation. The claim is stolen land has been taken back and being given to its rightful owners. When I've asked this question of people who say, oh, but my land was taken, or I know someone whose land was taken, and I say, was it originally stolen and was it being given back? And I've never once, and I understand that it could be very difficult to know this because often it is, I know a person who had this happen and the person who would have taken it was their great grandfather. So there's like, how would they know? And the family's certainly not going to pass down the oral tradition of we stole this house, don't tell anyone. And if they did, you're not gonna tell anyone. So there's a real problem with getting anyone to admit this. But this is the fundamental question. Did your family have a chain of custody going back to show that it was their house. Did your deed predate the problems and the, the uh, return of the property to the, to the rightful owners? That is being suggested. And never once have I gotten the answer, oh yes, no, we definitely owned it. Never once. And it doesn't mean very much, right? It's very anecdotal. But these are important questions. I keep asking, and every time it's, oh, no, we don't actually know that it happened, or we don't know that it wasn't for really good reasons, or we called it seizure and it may not have been, it may have been the reversal of a previous seizure, right? So these things are very, very important to understand that there are possibilities, right? So when people say, well, aren't you afraid? No, why would I be afraid? In a country where land seizure is incredibly rare, as opposed to the one I came from, where it's moderately common, and one where there are very strict laws protecting property versus one where there's very loose laws protect, protecting uh, property, one where law is more strict and versus law is more loose, and where there is a tradition that land is protected and property is protected. That doesn't mean that bad things can't happen. And as someone pointed out, all governments have the possibility of changing their policy, or the government could change, right? So you always have the risk all governments, by nature of being governments, can take property. That's the, it's the nature of a government. So that is always a fear, and that is correct. And it is always the possibility that the current government of any place will change its mind and not take things in the past and take things in the future. Absolutely true. It is also possible in any country that the government they have today won't be the government they have tomorrow. You'd think that goes without saying, but it's a real thing. And so the government of tomorrow may be one that really likes seizure. Absolutely true. And, and this was just pointed out to me the other day, Nicaragua has a very high track record for being invaded by the United States, could be other places, but specifically the United States, and that process involving land seizure, business seizure, property seizure. This is what happened all through the, the 1800s under William Walker. Everything was seized from the Nicaraguan people, and it wasn't until they started heavily seizing the property from Americans that lived here. Eventually, he accidentally seized the property and businesses of Vanderbilt, and Vanderbilt stepped in personally and started getting things back to everyone. But the United States' interaction with Nicaragua in its first 30 to 35 years of existing was one of widespread seizure from afar at massive scale. Then when it returned 70 years later, 
seizures began again. And so for a very large chunk, maybe as much as 80 years, of Nicaragua's relatively short overall independence history, which only just passed the 200-year mark recently, has been under a scenario where a foreign power was actively seizing things from the country more or less willy-nilly, as you might say. Given that that is the case, the fear that the United States will return and enact seizures of things from absolutely anyone they want, anytime they want, is a very real fear. So if your fear is that the current state of Nicaragua is likely to start changing the way that it has always behaved and start taking land instead of protecting property as it always has, I think that is a ridiculous fear to have. If your fear is that the United States is going to mount an armed offensive, invade the country, and attempt to start seizing things because it can, I think it's a very reasonable fear. But then you have to ask, as an American, it is still illegal for the American government to seize your property abroad. It undermines Americans' faith in investing in their own country. However, it is absolutely something that can and will happen. So those are, those are real fears, uh, and they are very founded. Um, but you also have to operate with, there is no country in the world where you're not fearful of a foreign invasion taking your land away. There are wars going on right now for this very thing in two different places. There is uh, always the possibility that a government will change its mind, that a different government will get elected or come into power, and that they will not respect land ownership just as a general thing. However, let's step back for a moment. As we progress through time, the world is becoming more and more attuned to the needs of, of property ownership. Countries that want to remain functional must have solid property ownership. And while foreign invasion does allow for a breaking of that because the foreign invader doesn't care about the way it looks for people investing in the other country, it does undermine confidence in the primary country. And the United States today would have a much harder time appropriating land and businesses of countries that it is invading for fun without causing a decline in confidence in the American investment mechanism because it just puts more risk and business doesn't like unnecessary risk. So certainly if they're going to invade because they want to get oil, yes, that will happen. But if they're, invest if they're invading because they want to steal your house, no. That is a very foolish thing to get into a game where they're taking random people's houses. It just isn't a thing. So I think that um, there, there's a number of things you have to look at here, but one of the reasons that I feel confident putting money into real estate investments in Nicaragua more so than investments in the United States, of course, is because the market is low here and the market is high in the United States. So we expect you expect to lose money if you invest in the U.S. right now. You expect to gain money if you invest in Nicaragua right now. That just is logical. It's just, just where they are on the, the constant fluctuations over time. But more importantly, I feel that all of the evidence, all of the trends, all of the real world observations and all of the fear expressed by the foreign countries looking at Nicaragua all support the same common thing. That in those other countries, land seizures are at least enough to create some worry, not a normal thing, but they are enough to make people always hesitate a little bit and be worried about land. And here we have no cause for concern. Maybe there are real risks, but whatever they are, we do not know what they are. They are unknowns. Those same risks could exist anywhere. There's always a possibility. So we can never rule out that something bad could happen. We can never rule out that there's no possibility. But what we can say is when looking at it statistically, when looking at it through logical evidence and, and interpreting everything that we see, we have absolutely real cause to have confidence in the Nicaragua system based on what we see in Nicaragua. We have absolute reason to have confidence on what's happening in Nicaragua based on what we see in the United States. And we have every reason to be just slightly, but only slightly worried about property ownership in the United States because it would not make any sense to have large scale property problems in the United States that would undermine much of the economy. That is not something they're going to do. One thing Americans love is their economy. So they only mess with it on a scale where it doesn't create ripples. And that means they're not gonna target you but if you do happen to have that one house that they need, yes, they will take it.
Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. Think critically. Do not just listen to the news. It is not your friend. Media outlets are not there to educate you, but the truth is often hinted somewhere in there in the things that they leave out or the things that they don't say or the explanations that they don't give. And if you take the time to look at both sides and think critically, often there is enough to at least piece together what the background of the story is likely to be. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymecoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Share on social media. Tell your friends about the show. When someone says, aren't you worried about, post a link to this show each and every time. Make sure that the act of trying to create fear and uncertainty and doubt gets this show promoted. Not the show in general. Yes, that'd be great. This episode specifically. And I will see all of you tomorrow. And just for fun, pick one of these four videos coming up on the screen. Go watch that too. That would be absolutely fantastic. See you all tomorrow.